welcome to lesson two in our training module, My Eco Footprint. Just to recap from the previous lesson, humans are the most successful species on the planet. But we are using more resources than the Earth can provide. We are in global ecological overshoot. Remember this, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. This is by another Mark, Mark Twain. Let's for a moment take a look at our current global situation. Since the 1970s, humanity has been in ecological overshoot with annual demand on resources exceeding what Earth can regenerate each year. It is now taking the Earth one year and four months to regenerate what we used in a year. And we continually maintain this overshoot by liquidating the Earth's resources. Overshoot is a vastly underestimated threat to human well-being and the health of the planet, and one that is not adequately addressed. By measuring the ecological footprint of a population, an individual, a city, a business, a nation, or all of humanity, we can assess our pressure on the planet, which helps us manage our ecological assets more wisely, and take personal and collective action in support of a world where humanity lives within the Earth's bounds. Conceived in 1990 by Mathis Wackenagel and William Rees at the University of British Columbia, the ecological footprint is now in wide use by scientists, businesses, governments, agencies, individuals, and by various institutions working to monitor ecological resource use and advance sustainable development. National governments using the ecological footprint are able to do the following. One, they assess the value of their country's ecological assets. Number two, they monitor and manage their ecological assets. Thirdly, they identify the risks associated with ecological deficits. Fourthly, they put in place policies that are informed by ecological reality and which in turn safeguards resources as a top priority. And five, they measure the progress towards their goals. It is very clear that countries and regions with surplus ecological reserves, not the ones relying on continued ecological deficit spending, will emerge as the robust and sustainable economies and societies of the future. The ecological footprint has proven one of the most successful indicators for communicating the concept of environmental sustainability and the physical limits of our planet. In the past decade, the ecological footprint has developed into one of the most important measures for resource use in production and consumption at the international level. No occupation is so delightful to me as the culture of the earth. No culture comparable to that of the garden. That was by Thomas Jefferson. We are going to take a look now at the very informative and enlightening statistics and data about various regions and countries ecological footprints. It makes for interesting reading and is quite sobering. Firstly, let's cover regions. In the last 50 years, China has soared from being one of the more moderate consumers of the planet's resources to one of the largest. This underscores the crucial role China will play in addressing the major resource challenges humanity faces in the 21st century. China's ecological footprint has quadrupled in the last four decades, with the country now demanding more from the planet than any nation except for the United States. If China were to follow the consumption patterns of the United States, it would demand the available biocapacity of the entire planet. This is likely to be a physical impossibility for China and for the other nations of the world. But if China chooses to model a new development path that achieves environmental quality and human well-being, it will lead the way for the world as a whole. Number two is Africa, and while African people per capita consume very little of the world's biological resources, the region's growing population is bringing it close to reaching its ecological limits. Examining information that relates to the role natural resources can play a part in advancing or if management 
in thwarting the region's goals to end poverty and disease and to explore how ecological limits apply and relate to human development in Africa. If everyone lived like Canadians, we would need 4.3 Earths to support us. While Canada is endowed with abundant natural resources, it also has the fourth highest ecological footprint per person of all nations. Results reveal that, with an ecological footprint of 7.6 global hectares per person, Canada is using resources and turning them into waste at a much higher rate than the global average. Number four, the growing economic strength of the European Union has doubled the ecological pressure on the planet in the last 30 years. Despite technological advances, environmental pressure has been growing at a faster rate than the European population, creating a deficit of natural resources for the rest of the world and for future generations. Let's now look at some countries. The first one. In December 2006, Switzerland became the first country in the world to complete a review of its national footprint accounts. Second one. After a comprehensive two-year study of ecological footprint methodologies, the European Commission has found the footprint to be a useful indicator for assessing progress made towards the EU sustainability goals. In 2004, the Commission launched a study to evaluate the ecological footprint as an indicator, examining its advantages as well as its shortcomings. The study found the footprint could be an effective tool for assessing and communicating progress towards objectives, especially when combined with a basket of complementary indicators. Number three, the objective of the project scientific assessment and evaluation of the indicator ecological footprint commissioned by the Federal Environmental Agency known as UBA in Dessau, Germany, was to assess and evaluate the footprint for its possible use as a national sustainability indicator for Germany. In 2007, the UK Department for Environmental, Food and Rural Affairs, also known as DEFRA, commissioned a study by Independent Consultancy Risk and Policy Analysis Limited to assess development since 2004 in eco-footprinting methodologies and their practical application. The goal of the study was to evaluate the usefulness of the ecological footprint for policy making in the United Kingdom. In 2001, the report Ecological Footprinting was released by the Directorate General for Research, Division Industry, Research, Energy and Environment and Scientific and Technology Option Assessments in 2001. What a mouthful! The report commissioned by the European Parliament presents arguments and evidence reviewing the ecological footprint methodology, comparing it with official and non-official indicators that are currently under development. France has conducted reviews of the ecological footprint as a step towards considering it for adoption as a national sustainability indicator. The first review, conducted by France's Economic, Social and Environmental Council, looked at the general assumptions of the ecological footprint and other sustainability indicators. This was released in May 2009. In 2008, the Spanish government completed an analysis of the eco-footprint of Spain. The report analyzed Spain's eco-footprint and its various components such as energy, forest land, etc. The country's ecological deficit and regional variations in biocapacity and consumption and discussed how these might be relevant to policy. Luxembourg's National Advisory Council for Sustainable Development commissioned the Resource Centre for Environmental Technologies in December 2008 to conduct a technical study for the establishment of the eco-footprint for Luxembourg. The study is intended as a basis for future yearly calculations of Luxembourg's footprint. Indonesia's Ministry of Public Works has completed a report on the country's eco-footprint as a basis for informing policy that can guide the country in a development path that does not compromise its rich natural capital.
According to the report's preface, implementation of sustainable development has to be based on complete knowledge of existing conditions and the desired state in the future. Looking at ecological footprints for cities, we begin with asking the question, why track resource consumption and natural capital? Local governments succeed by helping all their residents live fulfilling lives, both today and in the future. The availability of natural capital, nature's ability to renew and provide resources and services. It's not the only ingredient in this vision. However, without natural capital, healthy food, energy for mobility and heat, fiber for paper, clothing and shelter, fresh air and clean water, such a vision is impossible. Thus providing current and future human well-being depends on protecting natural capital from systematic overuse. Otherwise, nature will no longer be able to secure society with these basic services. Then we ask the question, what's in it for our local governments? Eco-footprint accounts allow governments to track a city or region's demand on natural capital and to compare this demand with the amount of natural capital actually available. The accounts also give governments the ability to answer more specific questions about the distribution of these demands within their economy. In other words, it gives them information about their resource metabolisms. For example, footprint accounts reveal the ecological demand associated with residential consumption the production of value-added products, and the generation of exports. They also help assess the ecological capacity embodied in the imports upon which a region depends. This can shed light on the region's constraints or future liabilities in comparison with other regions of the world, and identify opportunities to defend or improve the local quality of life. Footprint accounts help governments become more specific about sustainability in a number of ways. The accounts provide a common language and a clearly defined methodology that can be used to support staff training and to communicate about sustainability issues with other levels of government or with the public. Footprint accounts add value to existing data sets on production, trade and environmental performance by providing a comprehensive way to interpret them. For instance, the accounts can give guide environmental management systems by offering a framework for gathering and organizing data, setting targets and tracking progress. The accounts can also serve as environmental reporting requirements and inform strategic decision making for regional economic development. The global effort for sustainability will be won or lost in the world's cities, where urban design may influence over 70% of people's eco-footprints. High footprint cities can reduce this demand on nature greatly with existing technology. Many of these savings also cut costs and make cities more livable. Since urban infrastructure is long-lasting and influences resource needs for decades to come, Infrastructure decisions make or break a city's future. Which cities are building future resource traps? Which ones are building opportunities for resource efficiency and more competitive lifestyles? Without regional resource accounting, governments can easily overlook or fail to realize the extent of these kinds of opportunities and their threats. The Eco Footprint, a comprehensive, science-based resource accounting system that compares people's use of nature with nature's ability to regenerate helps to eliminate this blind spot. Let's stop for a moment and take a deep breath. This is such important information and so relevant in the world we are living today. Ecological footprinting adds a completely different and aware perspective on what goes in our world and in our lives and shows how important accountability for both input and output of resources is. Just like our metabolism. This is just something to think about. If it weren't for the last minute, 
nothing will ever get done. Businesses that look ahead and actively manage their ecological risks and opportunities can gain a strong competitive advantage. The eco footprint is being used to help corporations improve their market foresight, set strategic direction, manage performance and communicate their strengths. By providing a common unit, the eco footprint helps businesses to establish benchmarks set quantitative targets and evaluate alternatives for future activities. The Eco Footprint is compatible with all scales of company operations and provides both aggregated and detailed results. Eco Footprint analysis reveals where regions, industrial sectors and companies will face increasing limits in resources such as energy, forest, croplands, pastures, water and fisheries. It also helps identify strategies that will succeed in a resource-constrained world, including products and services that will be most needed in the future. It's all in the planning, and we have to think ahead for future generations. We come to the point now where we need to ask a very important question of ourselves. Why calculate our footprint? Measuring our ecological footprint can help us identify what contributes the most to our footprint and how resources can be used more efficiently in order to secure our own well-being, as well as that of the rest of humankind and the planet, both now and in the future. Calculating the eco-footprint for yourself, your household, office, school, shop or event helps to identify the environmental impacts of everyday activities and recording the progress towards more sustainable practices. The results of your ecological footprint calculation may even motivate you to make a few changes to your lifestyle that will help to achieve reduced footprints. For inspiration, view our case studies on how the footprint has been used and applied in Victoria or browse through our links for further ecological footprint information and contacts nationally and worldwide. We now get to a very interesting topic, ecological creditors and debtors. Today, more than 80% of the world's population lives in countries that use more resources than what is renewably available within their own borders. These countries rely for their needs on resource surpluses concentrated in ecological creditor countries, which use less biocapacity than they have. By comparison, in 1961, the vast majority of countries around the globe had ecological surpluses. Those numbers have slowly dwindled. Meanwhile, the pressure on the remaining biocapacity reserves continues to grow. As resource pressures escalate, ecological wealth will play an increasing role in determining countries' competitiveness and its citizens' ability to lead secure, rewarding lives. Through collaboration, countries can better secure the value of their natural resources and build incentives for maintaining those assets, a benefit to both their own citizens and to the global economy that relies upon these resources. A question then arises from this understanding. Is the ecological creditor debtor framework anti-trade? In a globalized economy, trade is a fact of life. Though we've introduced the concept of ecological creditors and debtors, we do not mean to imply by comparing a population's consumption with its own biocapacity that countries should consume within their own borders and not engage in global trade. On the contrary, but just as a trade deficit can be a liability, a country can find itself at risk of depleting its own natural capital, incurring higher costs for importing resources from elsewhere, or facing costs for emitting CO2 in the global commons. The Ecological Creditor and Debtor Initiative seeks not to discourage trade, but rather to enable countries to see the benefit in reducing their resource dependence on the one hand and increasing or maintaining ecological reserves on the other. There is actually a science 
called Ecological Footprint Science, which gathers information from 4,000 data points and 10,000 calculations per country, per year, to make the necessary calculations. We at EcoAnalysts use the calculation methodology from the 2010 edition of the National Footprint Accounts, or NFA, as it is more widely known. They provide the data that forms the basis for all eco-footprint analysis. This covers food, shelter, mobility, goods and services. Ecological footprint accounting is based on six fundamental assumptions. The first being the majority of the resources people consume and the waste they generate can be quantified and tracked. Secondly, an important subset of these resource and waste flows can be measured in terms of the biological productive area necessary to maintain flows. Resource and waste flows that cannot be measured are excluded from the assessment, leading to a systematic underestimate of humanity's true ecological footprint. Thirdly, by weighing each area in proportion to its bioproductivity, different types of areas can be converted into the common unit of global hectares. Hectares with world average bioproductivity. Number four, because a single global hectare represents a single use, and each global hectare in any given year represents the same amount of bioproductivity, they can be added up to obtain an aggregate indicator of ecological footprint or biocapacity. Number five, human demand expressed as the eco footprint can be directly compared to nature's supply. Biocapacity, when both are expressed in global hectares. And lastly, area demanded can exceed area supply if demand on an ecosystem exceeds that ecosystem's regenerative capacity. To end off this lesson, I would like to leave you with these thoughts. A man who is doing his bit to save on his ecological footprint decides to change from shaving blades to an electric razor, which is recharged from solar or wind at his home, which he has set up to simultaneously charge all the family's other 12 volt appliances, like cell phones, handheld devices, etc. He knows that ESCOM burns fossil fuel and loses 11% along the cable infrastructure which leads to the man's house, meaning that he would have to recharge the batteries himself eventually. He knows that the eco footprint of shaving blades are very high and they almost always end up in a landfill. By purchasing an electric razor that can be recycled when it is used is fantastic and then ensuring that it happens and makes a big impact. He also knows that blades use lots of water and the process of shaving means that the tap needs to run. As the water needs to be warm, the geyser needs to heat and this results in more fossil fuels burning to reheat the geyser. His new electric razor uses no water, hot or cold. So by making a decision to purchase an electric razor, and not use shaver blades shows us that simple, small life changes can have a huge impact on your eco footprint. Until next time, start observing the little ways you can start making changes. Goodbye.